Hello and welcome to the Be Glad movement. My name is Pollyanna and I'm on a mission to bring you as many stories as possible of good coming out of bad and reasons to be glad. And today I'm joined by Dave and you, some of you might recognise Dave from the heist. So hey, say hello Dave. Hi, hi everyone. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to pretty much say what I say to everyone that I'm going to get out of the way and just let you tell your story how it is in in your words so um over to you yeah um well it all started in uh, when i was 18 uh, i joined the military i was in the military police and at 21 i joined merseyside police and uh, started off at, at the bottom my story kind of starts there really um in 2004 um i was riding those bikes i'm, I'm massively into uh, adrenaline sports uh, a snowboard, skydive, bungee jump, speed, adrenaline, that's, that, that's, that's what I love to do. Awesome. Uh, and I went out uh, into Wales with my friend, uh, Russ Parker. Um, stunning day, perfect riding conditions. Um, I, went, I was just been to the Ponderosa, which is a nice kind of famous um, cafe where bikers go. Um, after we'd had a, a brew there, I was going, I lent into a corner and came on what's called the power band. So I came on the actual power. Um, unfortunately for me, there was diesel on the road. So the bike, I used to tell it, say that the bike dropped down and slid across. What actually happened is, as I've lent in and come on the power, it's twitched the back and a natural reaction is I, I jab the brake. And one thing you should never do on a corner is a brake, but it was a natural reaction. So that then sat the bike upright and went across the other side of the road. Wouldn't usually be a problem, but on the other side there was a articulated lorry, HGV, coming on the other side. And when you say time slows down, like you see in the movies, 100% it does. As I've gone starting to go across that road, the lorry must have been a couple of feet away from me, if that, um, probably slightly more. But I went through a full conversation and it went, right, this is bad. How are we going to get out of this? Do we, do we go on the power and shoot across the far side? I couldn't because it was a massive drop in Wales, stunning scenery. I'd have gone off and, uh, off and probably killed myself. I then mm. thought, should I bank hard left, go on the power to ride it, to get enough? Didn't have enough time. So my only option was to jump from the bike. So as I've made that decision, I've jumped off the bike, trying to get away from it. The bike's hit the front of the lorry. I've landed on my back and slid under the front two wheels of the uh, articulated lorry. Mm. Luckily, luckily, I remember the whole thing, went onto my back, slid under, both wheels went over my leg. And I knew it was bad because uh, my left leg snapped up above my head. Oh my the, God. Of, 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 yeah, I know, yeah. Um, no pain whatsoever. Your body's a, a miraculous thing and kicks in loads of endorphins. So I was lying there underneath the HGV um, and I, just, I was just waving to say, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. The guy gets out and I'm a massive, massive believer in faith. Um, behind me was an off-duty paramedic um, she came. To, she came to the scene, and I, I was waving, um, and I knew it was bad. I could see. I, I, I could feel my legs, so I did a quick check. Yeah, my toes moved. Not too bad, but there was blood everywhere, um, oh. and I thought, I'm, I think I might have gone through an artery here. So I knew, even in that kind of crisis situation, I had to stay calm because if I carried on, if I panicked, I would have bled out more. So even at that stage, I still knew I had to be calm. So I lay there, just chatting away, trying to keep calm. Um, I took, started taking my helmet off and everyone was trying to grab me. And I said, no, I know. I remember the whole incident. I've not hit my neck, my back. It's all lower leg injury. So I took it off um, and threw that across the, the, um, the road. Right. At the same time, my friend came back, obviously horrified at what happened. The bad thing was there was petrol and diesel all over the road, off the bike, off the original slip. People knew the road was about to be closed. So they were driving past my head when I was on the floor by about that much. Constantly wow. going, they knew the road was going to be closed. Oh uh, my and me, and my friend Russ actually stopped one of them and said, Listen, this is my, he's, he's critical here. Um, <laughs> basically, the guy went to go and he lent in, took his keys off, said, You're not getting them back until he's moved. So right. that was good. Yeah. So it, felt, it felt like an eternity for the ambulance there uh, to arrive. So everyone was just talking to me and keeping me, you know, what do you do for a living? And, uh, and the ambulance crew turned up and went to cut off my boots. Uh, and said, oh, we're going to have to cut your boots off, do you mind? I said, they cost me like 300 quid then, like laughing with them, mm -hmm. even at that point. And they said, well, it's 150 now. So, right. that, got, so that got cut off. Um, 
they then said, we're going to have to get your airlifted because you won't, they didn't say it to me, but they said it to us. We're going to have to get him uh, airlifted because he won't make it to the hospital. This is, he's likely to prove I, I'm likely to die on the side of the road. Wow. Air ambulance came in and obviously they strapped me to the board and everything. Passed me over a fence into a field, got pushed in through uh, in the back of the helicopter. And basically when I was in there, they said, uh, you ever been on a helicopter before? I said, no. So it's weird, really, because I used to work on a, a tri-service base, which was predominantly helicopters. So said, it's a bit of an extreme way to get in one. I said, well, I'm in one, though. And then he just said, um, I'm just going to give you something for the pain. I said, I'm not in any pain, you know. He said, it's because you're in shock. He said, I'm just going to give you something for pain. And I felt this cold thing in my arm and then nothing else. Um, I slipped into a coma. I was put in an induced coma for a week. Oh. Um, while I was out, uh, I'd gone through a uh, 12 hour operation on my legs. Uh, and the extent was I was 30 seconds away from bleeding out when I got to the hospital. At one point they were putting blood, blood in and it was just spraying out my artery and my leg. I'd crushed wow. both legs, my left leg that took most of the damage. Um, I had a 12 hour operation. I think it was like 36 blood transfusions. Uh, I had to have six metal steel pins external called an X-frame sticking out my bone three, three, and three, three. And the reason why I had that was because I completely degloved my leg. Oh. So, uh, so I had no skin whatsoever around the whole, probably from above where my boot was, so midway up my shin to just above my kneecap. Right. Completely gone. Uh, I lost, I've only got a quarter of a calf left now. Crikey. Uh, it was hanging on by tendons uh, and a bit of muscle. My family were told that I was going to lose my leg. Um, at that time, um, I'd just got into the Great Britain team, kickboxing, sport was my life, hockey, rugby, football, you name it, I played it. So I was 24, I think, at the time. Um, that would have destroyed me. Um, we got through the, the uh, surgery. Um, I also, on the other leg, I've got no ligaments still in this leg, in my left one. Um, it's held together with scar tissue now. Wow. In my right, on the right leg, um, I shattered my kneecap completely. So uh, that had to be X fixed with wire and put together, and that was in a full cast up to my thigh, uh, up to my up to my hip. I had a massive X frame on this one, which required um, skin grafting, which I hadn't had at that point because I was at Glen Clifford Hospital. Right. Um, yeah, so a lot going on. Um, I came. They tried to bring me round after a week, uh, but apparently I was crying. I was in too much pain, so they put me back under. The next day they did, and that's when the first kind of hazy remember. It's not like the films where you come round, oh wow. First thing I went to grab, I was intubated. So I tried to grab the, um, the intubation tube that went into my lungs. But if oh. I was to rip that out, I'd rip my lungs out. So I was oh. pinned down mm. and um, he slowly pulled it out. And I just rem the first thing I remember is not being able to breathe. And they were like, come Dave, breathe, breathe. I was just there going, and eventually I was like, and then everything's hazy from there. I don't really remember too much. I was heavily, heavily sedated on morphine, on all different types of stuff. I was transferred to Wiston in Liverpool for skin mm. grafting their specialist burns unit. For the first three, four weeks, I didn't know what was going on. Uh, I contracted what was called morphine psychosis. Okay. So basically, you're not supposed to be able to overdose with, a, um, with morphine. But what was happening with me is I hadn't got a clue what was going on. I was hitting it three times and passing out and going to sleep. I'd wake up, I'd hallucinate that I was in surgery, panic, hit it again, three, and I'd do that all night to the point I overdosed on it massively. Oh, crap. I, was I was having hallucinations as real as me and you were talking to each other now. The nurses were all out to get me. They said they were going to poison my cornflakes. Um, I hardly spoke while I was in there at that time because um, I was terrified they were going to poison me. I'd literally see them like we're talking and they would say, um, he shouldn't even be in here. He did this to himself on a motorbike. Let's, let's poison this, which was bad enough. I then saw my mum be executed in front of me because I thought the, I know it sounds stupid and funny, but I thought the, the hospital was being raided by terrorists and they dragged me mum in and told me, asked me where, where so-and-so was and I didn't know who it was. So he shot her in front of me. Uh, I didn't know actually what had happened to my legs. I hadn't come to terms with why I was in hospital. Um, there was funny bits where apparently there was a guy across and I, and I thought he was eating a pizza from um, Pizza Hut or Domino's or the, whatever. So I was going to him, oh, that smells really nice, that, mate. And he goes, oh, do you want a pizza? Said, no, mate, you, you enjoy. Apparently he was just sat there looking at me and I was talking to him and he's going to his wife, what's he talking about? That was a bit of fun. <laughs> it culminated after about three weeks. 
where I thought I was in a mental institute in Canada and I was rocking in my bed. I think my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, um, who we'd only just, another thing, we'd only just found out she was pregnant the week before with our mm. first. Um, her and my mum got, got a bit worried and said, this isn't right, this. So they got the doctor down and they said to him, he's not right. And he, he, I said, and I just got this moment, I currently said, can you take me off everything? I don't know what's going on. He said, you'd be in too much pain. I said, I'd rather be in pain and understand what's going on than not know what's going on type thing. So it took a couple of days for the, for the meds to wear off. And I just woke yeah. up one more, looked at my leg, looked at my other leg, looked where I was and just burst into tears. I couldn't, I couldn't believe, I was like, what's happened? And my mind was like mush and I had my mobile phone with me. And like, the first thing I wanted to do was phone, was phone my girlfriend. So I was like, wait, wait. But it was locked and I couldn't remember my, 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 my pin code. Right. So they dragged the telephone for me. I couldn't remember her phone, so I had to phone my mum. Phone my mum, like burst in tears, and then phone, phone, phone the wife. Uh, she's my wife now. Phone, yeah. phone my girlfriend. And that was the start of a very, very long and painful recovery. Um, luckily, they hadn't amputated my leg. And they said the only reason why I kept my leg was because how of the how strong my veins and muscles were in that through kickboxing and sport. I said nine out of 10 would have lost that. So I had this, I still had my leg, but I had to go through um, about eight operations in Wiston, skin grafting. So what they do is they take, and they've done it on mine, they've took the top layer of skin off on the thigh, they put it through a mangle and they kind of thin it out and then they lay it on and then put staples on. And apparently only 60% of them take, all of mine took, so I was quite lucky. Wow. The down having that was my leg was fixed for so long in a straight line that once they'd all taken and this cast on my right leg had come off, it wouldn't bend because the scar tissue had grown. I then had to learn how to walk again because I was told you will never walk properly ever again. Right. Which was quite hard for me to take, as I said before, with you know, sport was my life. I had all these thoughts of, oh, I've got, a, I've got a, a baby coming. I'm not going to be able to run and play in the park with it. So I had all these kind of thoughts. But the first part was getting to move my legs again. And it sounds stupid. I, they were like, right, pick your leg up. And I physically didn't know how to do it. I've been in bed, in the same bed for three months. Wow. Before I started to work. I've not seen daylight. I've not seen fresh air. I've not had a proper shower. Uh, the lads who used to come and visit me, we had like young nurses. They'd all be sat around me, talk me, because on a wall with a lot of old people, they'd all be going, oh, getting a bed bath, the most degrading thing I've ever had. Mm. I couldn't move, if you remember. And where my skin graft was, was like being stung a thousand times by scorpions. On It was like acid on it, it was constantly on fire. So every mm. time I had got rolled, I'd be in absolute agony, because all your nerve endings are on show. All your nerve endings are on show. So it was, it, was, it was brutal. And I had to kind of wipe paraffin into it every day which hurt yeah. then it was got rolled I got hurt but going back to where I was so then the nurses would be sat there and the next thing I'd need the loo they'd have to roll me over put a bedpan under me I'd have to go they'd take roll me back over in agony again they'd have to wipe myself it was the most degrading experience in my life was being in that bed and one of the nurses took pity on me and said you've not have you been outside yet I said no I said and it was the windows were behind me, so I was facing not not a window, so I never saw the outside. Oh. So she goes, give me a second. She came back, she said, I'm going to take you outside. I said, I can't, I'm stuck in a bed. She, she wheeled me all the way out to a fire door, opened the fire door, and I can't really explain that feeling of fresh air, sun on my face, and she just left me for a couple of minutes. It was one of the best experiences I've had. I know it sounds a bit stupid, but yeah. It doesn't, so got, it doesn't yeah, sound so, stupid. It's the simplest things that can bring you so much pleasure, yeah. isn't it? Massively, and so there, that, that was a good start for me. Um, but when I was doing the, um, that, was a, that was a good moment for me in that hospital at the time, but just going back, going backwards, I jumped ahead a, a little bit. Um, I was due to go down for surgery on, on my leg to get the skin graft in, and then they put me off that day and they canceled it right at the last minute because an emergency came in, which we got, so it's fine. So yeah. I had like a yogurt and that was it before, and then I was nil by mouth. I got cancelled every day for the whole week. So um, I literally dog it every night. It got to the point where I was six and a half stone. And that wow. Me, Twelve and a half. My, my weight back then when I was fighting was like 13. So I'd gone down six and a half. And I was, 
then they were saying, well, we don't know if he can get make through surgery. So the, the sister there on one of the ward rounds said, he's going down tonight, whether you like it or not. He said, I don't care. And, um, and he walked off and she just turned to me and went, they think they're in charge, but it's us. Lo and behold, I was first on the list, went down and, and had that operation. Awesome. But all them through, they'd all taken. I still had that big the X frame in, no longer got the cast. I then had to start learning how to walk in, as I said before, trying to pick my leg up, struggled. Eventually, one morning, I managed to do it. The thing is, because I've been lying down for so long or sat up, my blood pressure was terrible. So when I started to learn how to walk, as soon as I got sat up with the physio, I'd pass out. Oh, thank you. That first one. So then, so that took about a week, three, four days to a week of learning to sit up straight without passing out. The next bit was as soon as I dropped my legs over the, the side, they'd pass, I'd pass out again. And it was Hi. a constant thing of standing up, passing out. And it was always, the first time was quite funny though, because I, I sat up and I passed out and I, and I came around and I was on her shoulder and I thought, I fell asleep. I can't mm. believe it. And I just passed out. But lo and behold, I got through it. I started walking with like a Zimmer frame um, and then got released to Arrow Park, which is around the corner from, my, from mine. Sorry, my dogs. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so got to Arrow Park. Uh, I was only in there two, three weeks and I had to have the pins taken out. And the doctor came across and I was sat there. I was ready and thought, no one had ever seen this and it was it, it didn't go down to surgery we were just going to take him off at the bed so all the nurses and doctors at our park were all crowded around me because they'd not, they'd not seen it wow. right. but he said it may hurt a little bit but you'll be all right he started his junior did it he started screwing in and there was this crunch and i was in agony and i was biting into a pit screaming into a pillow he then stopped it and said have you had any um any painkillers i was like no and he went what so i got some more off and also what he did he then said to his juniors, you're twisting that the wrong way. He was actually dr going into oh my, my bone. God. When he goes, okay, I've got, he says, no, I think this lad's been through enough. And he removed them at, at, at there. After that, I was released. Uh, I came home. So I was about four months, I think, in hospitals, different hospital, Glen Cleary, Wiston, finished in Outer Park. Um, went, uh, got released home and I went to live with, with, with back with my mum. So I was in a flat, top store flat. So getting mm -hmm. upstairs was quite hard. So went back there and started doing physio at uh, Clatterbridge. I was doing physio for about six months and I could literally only got about 10% movement in my leg and basically gave up on me. Wow, so they started, gave up on you? Yeah, I, decided, I don't know what to do. My, my, um, literally, I didn't have any more appointments after a few months. So I was like, so I was at home hanging weights off it, just doing anything I can. Went to see a specialist doctor, um, pay private, Supposed to be the top of his field. Went to see him. I was 24, 23, 24. And he just said to me when I went in, and he had a leg problem himself, you need to get over yourself. This isn't going to get any better. You need to man up. These were his words. He said, your two options are, we amputate below the knee, which gives you the best kind of room for prosthetics, or we put a rod straight away and fix it. And I said, that's it? He said, yeah. So I come out, obviously in tears, floods. But yeah. refused. But went to see someone at the Royal, Dr. Nijmega. First thing I saw, he just manipulated the knee and it moved a little bit more. He said, no, I think we can, we can do something a bit with this. So I was like, great. Had two uh, uh, manipulations whilst un under anaesthetic. And what they do is they put a block into your, your leg, a uh, muscle relaxant, they put you to sleep and they basically crank your leg as much as they can. Wow. Just give it so I had two of them and each time I came around and I started crying, this way crying, I said, no, it's not worked. And he, he came to see and said, there's nothing we can do. He said, I literally was hanging on your, your leg. He said, if there was any more pressure applied to it, I'd have snatched your femur. Oh, he said, this is what we've got. You've got 45 degree movement for life, unfortunately. But I, again, refused to accept that. And I've managed to get 100. So Amazing. 100% movement in my leg. And I never move. I'm, and the thing is, people always go, I bet you regret going out on that day. No, I don't. Because who's to know I wouldn't have got killed the week after? Who, you know, I, as I said to you before, I'm a massive believer in fate. I think this, this adversity, this absolutely traumatic experience set me up for what I'm going to go on to talk about in a minute. Right. That was that. And I got back to playing. I got back and then it was, went back to work. I was, I was in the police. Um, went back to, to work him. 
found that I could kind of run okay. I had a bit, when I run, you can kind of see there was something wrong, but I still had, I could still run. So I went back, started playing football, played rugby, and I thought, you know, I'll go back to kickboxing. And I only meant, <laughs> only meant training, coaching, because I enjoyed it. What right. I found was I was still really good. And just if I, if I adapted the style I fought, I was still good. So I started back fighting, won loads of local fights, went on to win the Welsh Open Series title. Obviously, because I was in Wales, when I got all that blood, technically I'm Welsh. <laughs> I'll go for that one. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> but, but won that one, won the English, won the British, and then got asked to go to selection for Great Britain team for kickboxing. Amazing. Sort of hard training, like brutal. Got selected, and I went out there in November the second, I think it was, uh, in 2009, and I had five days of fights. So I had 11 fights over five days, which culminated me winning actually in the final against the Italian on his own home soil. Wow, that's uh, awesome. So, uh, so it was good, so it was a good kind of, and if the doctor ever's watching, he said, cut your leg off, well, uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, like, back Sorry, to sorry, Dame, but I was just going to say, so how long was it from having the accident to actually going back to work kind of thing? How long? Um, I think because I was quite pro proactive in everything I do, and I do, and I had the accident in September, and I think I was back in work within a year, but only on light duties. So right. I was only back because I was promised I'd never go into half pay. Okay. And when six months came on, I got dropped onto half pay. So uh. actually, then they agreed to give me an extra two months. So then I actually, so it was nine months I was back in work. Right. But only the light duties, I'd get picked up. I get dropped off, I'd, I'd, and it was staggered. So I'd go in for two hours, then it was four hours, and then back full on the beat, passing because I had a really good boss. Yeah. And basically, he said, "Well, I'll come on all the when you're in the police, you've got to do like the PSP, which is like self defence kind of, you know, cuffing." And so he came on it with me to make because you sometimes you get some who go a bit overzealous, think the kind of macho man. So right. he did it with past all them, and I was back on the streets within eighteen months. Wow. So, yeah, and then we'll stop back. Like, yeah, yeah, so not too bad at all. And then, yeah, running, everything's fine. Fast forward, career is going great. I've been promoted. I was a detective sergeant, uh, DS in Liverpool, in charge of kind of a covert unit looking at organized crime, gun, you know, gun crime, you name it. We were involved in it. High pressured. You know, I absolutely loved it. Come home, uh, left work one day. And said to my team, because I was one of the guys, I was always first in, so it was six, I was in it, got up at six in the morning, I was out the house by half six, in work for seven, I should have been home for three or four, ne I think I'd never got off on time, I was always first in, last out, because I was in charge, and that's what I thought I had to do, and we, it, it was quite a high profile unit as well, that we, sure. we just launched, it was a brand new one, that we just, just launched, and I was loving it, so I got home, and I said to my staff before I went off, it's my daughter's birthday tomorrow, so it's May the 1st, it's May the 2nd. If I am not off on time tomorrow, you can all go and find somewhere else to work. And then I'll right. laugh for them. So I left, got off late because we had a big firearms job in Cheshire and Merseyside. So I was in coordinating that between everyone. Got home about 11. Ran, got in, had a bowl of cereal. Uh, the wife, because she was my wife then, <laughs> uh -huh. was in bed. We got into bed. Went down. Next thing I know, I'm coming round to pressure being pushed on my chest. I'm like seeing like a luminous jackets in the room. And when I focused, basically um, I'd had a 15 minute seizure in my sleep and stopped breathing and was technically I died. So they were working on me. So I came round, but when I came round, I was groggy as I would yeah. just woke up. I was like, what are you doing in my room? And I had to be convinced by my wife that I'd had a seizure because I didn't believe her. I said, no, I'm fine. Yeah. Can you get out of my room? Like that. And I think yeah. and it was only when I turned around to look at my wife, sorry, and she wasn't there next to us. And I looked, she was crying there. And I still didn't believe it. She goes, and she's a, she's a nurse. And she goes, she doesn't swear. She goes, do you effing think I would phone the ambulance if there was nothing wrong with you? And at that point, I looked at my pillow and there was blood all over my pillow. And I bit through my tongue at the back. During the seat. And then I suddenly went, oh, my shoulder. I dislocated my shoulder as well. Wow. So then I thought, right, okay, let's go. And I knew there was something wrong when they said, so what do you do for a living? I said, oh, I'm in the police. Where do you work? I don't know. What's your date of birth? 
I don't know. And I was like, oh no, something's not wrong here. right here. Went into the back of the ambulance, got taken to hospital. They thought I had uh, bacterial meningitis. So I was, yeah. covered, I was covered in spots. But it was because the, the seizure was that violent, I burst all my kind of blood capillaries. My oh brain. my goodness. Yeah, so, and my wife being, right, I was in quarantine in resource and she said, you're too well. She goes, there's no way. And then at that point, the memory started coming back and I kind of knew everything. And at one point, I was like, right, once we're done here with the blood tests, I'm going, this is ridiculous, this. Um, went through loads of blood tests, like um, injections, scans, and then it was when I went for a CT scan. Came back up and said, we want you to go down with a contrast, with a dying. So, okay, got that, went upstairs, and it was my daughter's birthday this day, Now it's now May the 2nd. Of course, yeah. We never associate it, because I had the seizure about quarter to midnight on the first, so that was the day it happened. And um, all my family had come in to see us and everything. And then the, 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 the consultant came in and she just, she looked at me and was taken back because I was in a side room. She goes, oh, I've got your results. Do you want me, do you want me to do it in front of them? I said, no, I want everyone out, bar my wife. Right. So obviously they all went out and she sat down and I could knew it was bad because she had, you could see her eyes had glazed over. I said, just tell her what it is. And she went in. Unfortunately, we think you've got a, a large, um, brain tumour at the front of your uh, hemisphere, your brain, in the glioma, the brain, because we're not a specialist hospital though. He said, we've liaised and we sent the scans over to Walton uh, Neurological Centre, amazing place. And yeah, that's it. He said, unfortunately, it was a bank holiday weekend. This was the Friday. Right. The appointment is until Tuesday. He said, and it was, it was, it was something that was absolutely cracking the flags. And he said, there's nothing we can do for you here. We can give you, I had to go on steroids, medical steroids. You can take them at home. We don't want you in here till, till that Tuesday, so we're gonna send you home. So I went home that night. And the only way I can describe the next four days was like being on death row. Yeah. Because previously, about three, four months before, I was working the Liverpool Everton game, and one of my staff, I was on the serial, he wasn't one of my staff, but he was put with us. We were in yeah. a bit of bands, I support Liverpool, he supports Everton. The next day, he had a stroke. He died three months later of a brain tumour, a glioblastoma, multiforma. Okay. So all I had in my head is, that's going to be me. That's going to be me. And, all, and the way I explained it was like being on death row for four days. And when I got to the appointment with the, at Walton, that was like the governor saying, yeah, you've got a reprieve, you've got another chance. And that's exactly how it felt. And when we got in there, I explained this to them. And they said, well, there is something we can do. And it was like a weight off, off my shoulders. Right. Um, so we don't know what it is, but it is a low grade because of it. it's grown up white, so it's not holding the dye. Um, sorry, it's holding the dye or the other way around. If it's black, it means the cells are dead and it's mutating. So I was like, okay. Um, and then he sent us away with no plan. And it was, uh, I was like, what? And it was like two, three weeks of chasing up. And my wife was on the phone to secretaries all the time. And I was just in this limbo of like, I don't know what to say. So you had this appointment, you got yeah, some, some information, yeah. but, oh my goodness, yeah. And then it was like, and I was waiting because they go, they sent it to an MDT, a multidisciplinary team meeting, where they have physiotherapists, radiologists, and they, everyone's in and they just discuss people's cases. And we kept phoning up and he said, oh, we put your, so part of me was like, well, it's not urgent, so it's not that bad. But then I've still got this, ten, it was the size of a tennis ball as well lump in my head in the front and eventually my wife got through and said yeah you booked in for surgery and they and as soon as I found out that I had a, a, a deep surgery I thought right something's happening because at that point there was no plan I was in limbo and I thought what what's going on that's really scary isn't it sort of not knowing what's going to happen so then I was told I couldn't train as I said training has been my life um I was told I couldn't lift weights couldn't do anything I was like okay what can I do and Without my wife knowing, but she she did. I felt as I couldn't sleep for the, those six weeks. I had two hours sleep a night, so I'd wake up and I'd, I'd and the bed was like a prison to me. It was like you're sitting there, sleep, gotta get sleep. All these things going through my head, right? I'm gonna die. I'm not gonna walk my daughter down the aisle. I'm not gonna grow up to see my, my son. You know, I I'm gonna leave my wife a widow. Or what's she gonna do about the house? And I wasn't concentrating on my health and. It was, it was yeah. all this, all this swirling in my head. So when I eventually fell asleep, 
as soon as I woke up, bang, it'd go again, my mind would race. So I'd either come downstairs and I'd start decorating my whole house, um, painting, <laughs> and then other times I'd just go for a run and I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> but at home, me being me, back then, I was a man, I'm not supposed to show any sign of weakness. So I didn't want to cry in front of the kids or my wife. So I'd go for a run and the first mile I'd be running and I'd be in just tears, letting it all out. Second mile, I'd say, right, get yourself together. Third mile, because I only, I only did a three and a half mile. Um, third mile would be me like, right, you're going to beat this? Yes, come on. And I'd get back and the endorphins would be flowing, that positivity, and I'd, I'd be all right. Then me, my wife then caught me showering. She what have you been doing? So I mm. went for a run. Oh, I was tore strips off me. And she was right because it was dark at night and it was like five in the morning and I'd had a seizure in the night. So if I'd have dropped down and had a seizure, right. nothing on. But what I did say is like, I've got my phone on me. It's got my emergency contact. Had my steroid card, you get a card. That's on me with everything that, who I am and your details are in that. So, but she understood, I think I needed that as a bit of a release. Oh. And then, and then went in for surgery. Um, quite used to being, having surgery. So I quite liked being put to sleep. Cause okay. it's not when, when I was a kickboxer and I've had surgery on that. On the, on, the, on the thumb, my knuckles, I'm quite used to having surgery, especially with my leg. And I quite used to like being put to sleep and trying to fight it. So much different this time around. I was absolutely terrified. They come up and they obviously say, there is a high chance that you're having brain surgery now, so you're going to have the craniotomy. So they cut a square in your skull, take that out and operate. So there is a high chance that it could be fatal. Not only that, strokes, aneurysms, infections, Oh, you know, they, they go through everything. And I was just sat there going, right, okay. And when they were wheeling, wheeling me down in Walton, the brilliant award, Cairns Ward, oh, I can't rate them enough. As I was getting wheeled down there, I was in floods of tears, shaking, panicking, just going, oh, God. Because it wasn't only that, where mine was, is also where your personality is as well. Right. So it could come back and not be the same person again. So it was always, I had that in the back of mind. So even if I survived, and it's a funny thing, my wife said, wouldn't it be funny? If when you came back, you had a really camp voice and you're like, hi, everyone. I was like, yeah, hello. <laughs> <laughs> went to surgery and when I went into the room, it was just a hive of activity. And like I say, I'm used to having operations on my leg and there was three of everyone. And then there was two in the system. One leant over and said to the other one, does he need something? And he looked me up and down and said, no, he should survive this, I think. Oh my and, God. And, then, and then one of them went, you, are you all right? You've gone grey. And I said, I was like, yeah. He said, do you want a, um, a, a pre-med? I said, what's that? And he said, it's just relaxing. Yeah. I said, well, you just put me to sleep now and we can get over it. He went, do you know what? That's a good idea. Or she said, that's a good idea. And then yeah. bang, gone. Recovered really well. I was up talking two hours after surgery. Surgery was four hours, three hours, uh, four with the uh, intense care. What's supposed to happen? You're supposed to go to intense care, high dependency unit, it back onto the ward. But I was up talking within two, two hours. Wow. I said, oh, what day? I oh, no, it's still the same day. I went straight back onto the ward. My mum was there, my sister, my wife, all there. And they couldn't believe I was talking. I was discharged four days later. Amazing. Recover. My wife being a nurse took all the stitches out and cleaned up the wound that was on my head. Um, and kind of got back into the normal life and thought, great. Got back training. Was um, I'd already done my qualifications to be a strength conditioning coach. And I, I took retirement I chose to be medically retired it actually said you know you can stay on we'll still pay you I thought well if I'm going to make a new life for myself it's got to be done now right. and it was a sort of when I was off work every month I'd have to go and see the doctor to get a sick note because I couldn't have one extended I thought that's stressing me out when I was in the gym I'd see people and I know it's stupid what I'm saying now I'd see people training who I knew and they'd probably think and I'd be thinking oh they're thinking oh there's nothing wrong with him why is he off work but I know that's, it wouldn't, but it was just how you play sure. things. But yeah. I chose, chose to retire it, uh, early. But I'd already done all my strength and co uh, conditioning qualifications and started working at the underground training station. A year on, I turned to vegan. I was researching, so I thought, right, I'm, I ate kind of relatively well anyway through sport, but I yeah. massively researched everything. When the results came back, it was an astrocytoma, and they gave me... Uh, the histology of it they gave me five years to live and I want to know everything and I yeah. said well how do I die in five years don't understand he said well what happens it will mutate into a glioblastoma multiforma 
then you've probably got, depending on how aggressive it is, three to 12 months, potentially 18 months. So there's sort of, okay, nice one. Virtually a year to that, to, to that day, probably a month later, I just got back from Amsterdam on mate stag do, went in for my results in a scan, and Professor Eldridge was there. And the thing with Professor Eldridge is, is he do, he's not very good with people. So okay. I met with Anna, uh, it was a new, Anna Crofton, who's a neuro, her, her neuro nurse, who's amazing. We had this quite good relationship as a team. So if I knew he was there, I knew it was bad, walked in, and um, yeah, it turned into a um, grape sized glioblastoma multiforma. It's known as the Terminator, it always comes back. Um, yeah, um, wow. my, my world came crashing down around me. It was just like, it was that bad that I had to be surgery that weekend. Wow. And then, had my sur- and then I was going in on the Sunday. Um, from scan to surgery, uh, surgery didn't go as planned. Scan to, it, it was a lot longer. From the scan to surgery, it doubled in size. Wow, so that, in a week? Yeah, that's how aggressive it, is. it, it was. Uh, no, that was within three weeks. Okay, cranky. I had to, I had to wait three weeks for the, for, the, for the results, so it was three and a half weeks. Yeah, so that, everything was just, sh- it, life just span upside down once again. Um, but surgery obviously took a lot longer. I ended up spending 14 days in hospital. Um, I was out, it took a lot longer to recover. I was in a lot more pain. Um, I was in the high dependency unit for a, for a day or two. Um, and me being me, another thing is they took um, where the blood gases are out on, the, on my wrist. Uh, and the nurse called Una, who I'm still friends with now, removed it and then put, um, I said, oh, I need to get something. Don't move, hold that. So I took it off. I was like, oh, it's not bleeding. So I started getting myself ready. Looked down and it was spraying blood everywhere. Oh, no. I just remember shouting, Una, I'm bleeding out. <laughs> <laughs> the head nurse came in and looked. I said, no, it's my fault. She said not to. And obviously, patched it up. Um, yeah, about on day 10, 11, 12, one of the last days, but hazy. Um, the nurse there, um, Christine, amazing, really good friends with her. said, you're not leaving because you're not on top of the pain. So I just wanted to get out. So you stay until we have the histology. So they said, we've got the results. What do you want to do? Uh, she goes, come into the room with us. So I'm, I was walking fine. So I walked in, we all sat down. And you could see, and because I got on really well with Anna. And I said, listen, it's a glioblastoma and I've got 24 hours to live. So whatever you say now is a bonus. And she laughed, said, yeah, no, it's a glioblastoma, but you do have more chance. She said, do you want to know your prognosis? I know you do. And I said, is it the standard? Because I already know it. And she goes, yeah. So it was three months without treatment, 12 months with, because mine was highly aggressive. Right. And then depression kicked in. Sure, I bet. Like, it really did. Um, I, had a, I had to recover six weeks from surgery, and then I had to start on radiotherapy and chemotherapy combined together. Um, yeah, kind of gave up on myself, really, gave up on life. Um, sat on the couch, waiting to die. Yeah. And I really was, and I sat there and I just thought, what's the point anymore? What is the point in being positive and doing all this when I'm going to die anyway? So what's the, what is the point? Yeah. So I sat, I sat on the couch and I literally was waiting to die. I was just sat there and then my wife came in and said, come on, let's go for a run. I was like, no. Why? And I was like, what is the point of me doing anything like that fitness wise? I'm going to die. What's the point in trying to get fit? What, you know, and I, they, I'd sank into this quite, quite deep depression. And yeah. um, I said, no, you're coming. And you know, we, you know, women always right. So she drags me out. We go on a five day run. It was the worst run I've ever done in my life. I literally stopping. I was like retching. I, and I was going and Mrs. was way ahead and she beat me. And it's the only time she's ever beaten me at anything. So. <laughs> that because she's not here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> edit that bit out. It's all right. <laughs> at night, I slept a bit better. I felt a little bit better. And the next day, I was sat there just before I was about to start radiotherapy and I just had a conversation with myself on my own. But right, you've got two options. One is you can sit here on the couch like you've been doing, you know, waiting to die, being depressed, which to be honest, I have every right to do. You know, the, the car's been dealt once again. Yeah. Or actually, I can 
spend the time that I have got left, enjoying life with the family, being a rat, surrounded by, by the people that I love. So luckily, and excuse the pun, it was a no-brainer, I chose that route. Yeah. And just to go back a bit, um, just before I was diagnosed in 2014, and I, people say, where'd you get your strength from, the positivity? Um, I lost my nine-year-old cousin to a um, neuroblastoma. And the way she dealt with it, for half her life, she dealt with it. Wow. The chemo, and she was the happiest thing. She was in pain. And I kind of thought, well, if she can, then I can. Type right. thing. I'm from, and, I, and again, fate, I think what I went through with that bike accident as well, that mental toughness that had built that up in me. So I thought, you know what? And at that point, I still wasn't thinking I'm going to survive. I thought, no, you know, let's take the fight to it and see what happens. And I started, I called it Terry. And he was my opponent. And I started relating it to his rounds using something like my kickboxing. So every, yeah. every surgery was around. And that's how I got on with it. And I remember going in once to them and I was saying, oh, I've researched this and I'm taking this supplement and I've done this and this is anti-cancer. And basically any, anything that said was that would prevent cancer or inhibit it, I'd be taken to the point it was ridiculous. Right. Um, and then I started um, combined radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Um, Tomorrow's I'd 150 uh, milligrams with, and what happened, I'd go to Clatterbridge, 20 minutes before I'd get the tablets, I'd take the chemotherapy tablets, then I'd go in and have mine um, uh, get strapped into a machine, bolted in. One of the worst things was before that was getting your mask made, mold for your right. face. But when you're in that machine, you physically cannot, you don't, you don't want to move because you've got these radiation grays going all over your head, the machine spins around. So if you go, and it's targeting certain places, so they're not right. blasting the your brain, but they're getting half of it. And obviously it leads to the onset, it can lead to the onset of early dementia, X, Y, Z. So you've got to be bolted in. So you, they lock you in and you physically can't move. And you'll be thinking of something and suddenly you won't be thinking of anything. And it's like the rays were destroying those brain cells that were making you think. And it was a, but afterwards I'd go in all right and I'd come out frazzled and like feel really ill. I'd come home and I'd have to go to bed and just lie there and recover. Yeah. Um, when my sister Vivian has been a rock, taking me, and when she got home, she got home probably she was crying because of the way I was. Um, went relatively okay through, through that period. In the last week, um, I'd gone to, um, I'd gone to uh, the Rugby World Cup, massively into rugby. Um, work, kind of work, a brand ambassador for Under Armour now. And um, got, they gave me tickets, a full experience to go and, as guest of honour, go and watch the game, watch the game, watch them lose, as you do. Uh -huh. I was being, I was being um, first, only the second time ever Wales had beaten England at Twickenham and I was there for one of them. But it was a good experience. But I was being sick quite a lot. And I was like, I should have seen the warning signs. After that weekend, I came home after a session into, into my final week of, of radio. Everyone was saying, you've done really well. I went to bed. And I just had this one thought in my head of, because um, I had a cut on my skin graft and that morning I'd, I'd changed the sheets and there was all this soaked blood in and, it, and I thought, oh God, I might have got an infection in that. That one thought and suddenly I had, a, I had a, um, um, a psychotic breakdown that led to me being outside in the street, spinning around, shouting. <sighs> yeah, it wasn't good. Um, at the time we were done on the house so the guy in there did, hadn't got a clue what was going on my wife came home and I was lying in the, in the front of the road talking gibberish um, at the time I thought I was talking sense completely wasn't yeah. uh, got taken into Clatterbridge into resource and then for four days on this day ward and they were looking at section me uh, under the mental health act and it, um, but I was on a ward which didn't it was day ward people were coming and going and there was one nurse there who was horrible and like every time I tried to speak, she's like, "Oh, okay, okay, Dave. Oh, yeah, whatever." Oh. So I just so and then, but then there was a guy opposite me who had dementia, and he was saying that his daughter was on X Factor and was winning it. And we she was all like, "Oh my god, which episode? Oh, I watched that." And I was thinking, yeah. there, what are you going on about? You know, he's got dementia." But when I said things, it didn't come out properly. So I learned I just had to shut up, and it was hard. And to prove it, that nurse, when I got released, she said, "Oh, you, 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 your daughter's here." To pick you up, I said, What do you mean, my daughter? So, the daughter's like at the time, she was like six, seven. She said, She's yeah. seven. Like, oh, um, oh no, sorry, your girlfriend. 
I was like, I haven't got a girlfriend, I've got a wife. And she was, oh, and went out with my wife. And as soon as I got wheeled out, I burst into tears because yeah. I didn't ever get off that ward. But um, it was one guy, they said, class of it, sent up a neuro um, kind of guy for, who deals with that. And straight away just said, it's all right. He says, You're the, no, this isn't mental, this is something else. I had to go and see a psychologist and basically I was on medical steroids for too long. So I was on, I think I was on 16 milligrams or 12 milligrams every day for four or five months. So mm. it, with the radiation, with everything, it just completely spiraled yeah. out of control. So got through that uh, and then had uh, a month off and then started on double strength chemotherapy. So basically what happened is I'd have five days of chemotherapy tablets because it because it's the brain, you're protected by a blood brain barrier. So therefore, right. normal chemotherapy in the vein. So if you got like a blood infection, if you didn't have that blood brain barrier, you'd be dead. So it has to cross the blood brain barrier two ways, stomach and under your tongue, sublingual root. So it's chemo tablets in, and that's the same for when I was a brainer. So the first cycle will be five days of tablets, a week kind of feeling rubbish, and then two weeks recovery time, like where I'm feeling okay. First one, Five days, didn't give me enough anti-sickness. Start being sickness on the, sick on the sixth day. I was sick from nine o'clock at night till half ten in the morning. Oh. And basically what happened is, I, I, I don't feel well. I go and be sick. But I was that violent sick, I was soaked. In the end, I was just taking my clothes off. Being sick for half an hour, getting back into bed. I'm like, there's a cycle. But what I'd happen to do is because I was starting to get the lining coming up, was just drinking water, knowing I, I'm going to throw it up in a minute. Yeah. Got to 10 o'clock in the morning, just looked at my wife and said, I can't do this anymore. So she phoned up and said, get into hospital now. Got to hospital, put me on a drip, give me a load of fluids, give me cyclozine, which was brilliant because I was completely out of it, couldn't even walk properly. Mm. Went home, right, we'll give you some more um, anti-sickness. Second cycle, exactly how the same happened, even though they give me more. Third cycle, they said, we've never had anyone be sick as much as you. We're going to try with this. Um, we've not given it to anyone. I can't remember what it's called. But it's one that they give for other types. That right. actually works. And they, they got set up for a syringe drive or everything. That actually worked. So then my cycle became, lie on the couch for, for those five days, feeling like crap, shall we say, watching uh, onto our school hall, not any series, just sitting there. Second week, they're recovering, just getting back on my feet. And then the second and third, uh, third and fourth week, I'll be back in the gym training. I had no hair. I'd lost all my ra hair with radiation. And yeah. it's just... That was keeping me sane, just keeping on top of like, until the fourth cycle where stupidly I went down. The day I finished chemotherapy, the, ne the next day we went to the rugby with the lads, the Six Nations. Um, went there, I'd stopped taking my anti-seizure tablets for two weeks prior. Because they said, one, my doctor said I'd never have a seizure again. So part of me was like, why am I taking them? But then he's, on the ones I'm on, which is um, Kepra, which is the brand name, leather some anti-seizure tablets anyway uh -huh. if you have one drink it's like having six oh correct so that's why i thought two weeks before i'll stop it because i'm going to have one or two that, that, that's it because I, I don't drink anymore anyway much you know once <laughs> in a blue moon. um so i had two guinnesses and that was it um decided you know what i'm going to bed early and again this is where fate plays one of the mates drops out last minute so one of me, I got me one of my oldest mate, best mates came. He wasn't really into rugby. I said, you come. They all went out for a night out. I said, I'm going to bed. And he went, I'll come with you. Right. I, woke, I woke up two days later in Slough Hospital. I'd had five seizures overnight. Now, if my mate wasn't in, with me, and it, like, because we we're in the same room. Yeah. I'd have just been there on seizure after seizure after seizure. And the damage could have been horrific. Sure. Because of that, it cleaned through my tongue. So it was in half at the back. Um, I dislocated both shoulders um, and it's just the most surreal experience is going to sleep in a bedroom with your mate, coming around two days later with my sister and my, my um, wife there. My mum didn't answer the phone, so she, she wasn't there. Right. So that, that was, and I, I don't really remember much about that week because they pump you full of all sorts to stop you having seizures. But then, um, to really move this on, uh, yeah. Smashed on, kept going, kept going. Next cycle was fine. Next cycle, then I was out. And then it was the recovery time. Um, and at this point, I'd started thinking, I want to be a new type of statistic now. I'm not going to be a 
I, I'm not going to be the statistic that goes within 12 months. I'm not having that. I'm taking this fight to it. And I was researching. And that kind of meltdown as well made me think, you're taking too much. It's like a job. I had a list of stuff. Supplements were taken. Right. Cancer is a disease of the immune system. The byproduct is the tumor. So, right, let's target stuff that boosts the immune system. So then I just I whittled it right the way down to certain yeah. supplements. Um, that boost your immune system and to prove it I take a thing called lip liposomal vitamin C it's like the purest form of vitamin C in liquid form I was taking 8,000 milligrams a day through chemotherapy there was a family do at Christmas and half of them weren't going to come because they were quite ill I said just come I'll be fine I never so much, no, never so much picked up a sniffle I had no immune system whatsoever so I knew that really well so that yeah getting on during that time uh, I lost my nan. I lost both my nans. Um, yeah, I um, lost both of them. Um, you know, I'd had two. So I was now. What, where am I now? Let's have a sip of, sip of tea. Yeah. <laughs> In that four-year period, up to now, I'd had. Um, I'd lost my nine-year-old cousin to cancer. I'd. Um, I'd had, uh, I've been diagnosed, I'd had a seizure, I'd had two times brain operations, I'd come through them, I'd had chemotherapy, I'd had a full psychotic breakdown, um, I dislocated both shoulders, bit through my, my tongue, bit through it again so it's clean in half, lost, me, lost both my nans, um, my wife, we, we got, got pregnant with our third, and the day oh. before I was flying to Las Vegas with my wife to see um, her cousin Tom fight in the UFC, um, she wasn't feeling well, a bit of bleeding went in and we actually lost the baby. Oh. We'd had all that to deal with all this time. And um, yeah, it, it was hard to keep, keep sane oh. and keep positive. But I don't know, but I just, I just did. I, I yeah. just thought, we've got to keep going for the kids. I've got two right. kids. Um, a big thing for me was, all my daughter and son have known, is anyone who has cancer? dies because before that one of my, one of my closest friends a, a bloke called Ian Wilde I was very close with their family his son at the same time as uh, my cousin Eve got neuroblastoma he got leukemia and he died just before so because we were friends with them so my daughter and son knew Elliot Elliot Wilde who died Eve she died I got cancer during that time um Sam, my, my wife's um, uncle, got cancer and died, but he was he was 89, but don't understand this. So everyone who gets cancer dies. Going on from there, recently, obviously I was supposed to do an interview with her a while ago. Um, yeah. My mum, a few years ago, got diagnosed with ovarian cancer, stage four, and ovarian cancer, you only know you've got it when it's too late. Right. Unfortunately, um, <sighs> she passed... Um, about three months ago. Yeah. Three times. Positive through all this, and I don't know how I do sometimes. Um, but what helps me is helping others. Um, and off the back of my my cancer, my friend, one of my friends, Matt, who was the one who was with us with me, um, brain tumor, um, when I had the seizure. So why don't you do a blog? And just write about it. I said, I don't mind. Yeah. No, but it's still my therapy. And a couple of things. I started doing a blog. Then I, then I set up a Facebook page and started just, you know, documenting my, and I, I did it raw. Like one of the things, was, um, have you ever seen your dad cry? And it was, it was like, and I got so much so that it, at one point, and I've not checked, I don't do the blog side of it so much anymore. I do the Facebook page more. Um, yeah. Over half a million people have read it in 48 countries. In some countries, I didn't even realize they had the internet. And then I was getting messages from all over the world saying, not just from people who are in my situation, but like care is saying, because I did a whole piece on radiotherapy and took my kids in to show them and put pictures and everything. I was saying, my son won't speak to me about stuff like this. I don't know what goes on when he goes behind those doors. Thank you. Or I'd have a message saying, I now understand what's going on in my son's head at night. And so for me, turning my horrific situation in a negative into a positive by helping others is probably the best way. I think the most warm I can come out of this situation yeah. What I can, I'm not, now I'm kind of getting involved with motivate. I do a lot of motivational speaking, and um, 
what I like to say, and it's something I don't get, people are going, what, you're such an inspiration, it doesn't sit with me whatsoever, that I just, for me, I'm just a dad, a son, a brother, a friend, whatever, who just wants to live, I just want to live, and if I can help people along the way, then I will, and by, yeah. by blogging about my story, and all the research I'm doing, and showing how well I'm doing, I'm inspiring others to do the same, because when I was at the beginning, you told, don't go on Google, you know, don't research, there's nothing out there, and there wasn't. And I found a, a woman in America called Cheryl Proyles, Boyles, and she'd been living with it for 16 years. Wow, 16. And I thought, like, right, hope. So I thought, well, maybe I can be that hope. And now I'm four, four or five years past my sell by date. I'm getting people saying, thank you, you're, you're giving me hope. And that's all I kind of want to be now is this hope yeah. and showing, look, if I can do it, you can. The big thing with cancer patients is I've found that people go through adversity, they just give up. And what yeah. I say is, you know, quitting is, is permanent but, and I'm failing to try is, is permanent. I've got that a bit slightly wrong, I think. But anyway, quitting is forever. But yeah. if you try, then that, you know, oh yeah, I'm, getting it, I'm getting it all mixed up. I say it really well, usually <laughs> when I'm doing a motivation speech. But for me, you know, quitting's forever and that's yeah. not my thing. I don't quit. If I'd have quit and listened to the doctors when that, that leg, I wouldn't have a leg, I wouldn't have gone on to win a world with kickboxing champion. If I'd have listened to them saying, you know, there's nothing you can do, um, go away, enjoy the time you had and eat what you want, I wouldn't be here speaking to you now. Yeah. And what I can say is for me, and a lot of people think, go what? I'm actually grateful now for this, what happens yeah. to me. The positives massively outweigh the negatives. In so much so is, obviously I wouldn't be speaking to you here now, would I? Sure, sure. <laughs> But I'm feeling like I need to put a disclaimer in and say that I haven't paid you to say no, that. No, I don't get paid for this. <laughs> I don't get paid for a lot of the stuff I do. It's just me trying to help others. But um, little things like I got to walk my daughter to school. Do you remember what I was saying at the beginning? I'd be working 16 hour, hours a day. I wouldn't see them in the morning. I wouldn't see them at night. I'd go in and kiss them on the head and stuff, but they wouldn't know I was there. Weekends, I'd be tired. I'd be playing rugby and I'd be doing other things. Now, walking my daughter to school, just simple things. Go and see their plays. Go and see my son doing his sports days. Playing is I'm there more. I've got better relationships with my family. Not that I had bad bad ones, but with my yeah. sister, I feel weird if I've not spoke to her in two days. Whereas before, I could go a month because I left yeah. home at 17 to join the forces. So I've always been away in that. So now it, I get closer bonds and relationships. Um, I wouldn't have gone on to have done the experiences that I probably would have. Otherwise, I'm working in a gym that I love. I'm get you know, and off the back of that, I've then been on the heist. Yeah. I wouldn't have been on that because I do motivational speaking and word of mouth. So it's all the little things, and I love life, and I wouldn't swap my life for anyone. Yeah, would I have preferred not to have gone through this and gone through the pain to find this? Yeah, obviously. Would I have preferred not to have depression? Obviously, but I still wouldn't. If I was to drop dead next week, I'd have no regrets. Whatsoever. Um, and that's kind of what I try and get across. Obviously, I'm not going to drop dead next week. I, I, in my head, positivity is huge. And same people, I get a lot of people messaging me probably about nine, ten times every day. Messages from all over asking for help and stuff. And again, saying to them when they've just been diagnosed, positivity is key. You've got to be positive. You've got to have a reason to live. You've got to want to live. It's hard saying it. Yeah. Because I put myself back into that when I was first told, and just in floods of tears, and you just want to give up. And it's getting over that. And I always say that to them. I do say it to them. You will be down. And the good thing is, everyone says you're always positive all the time. You live with terminal cancer. You've got this going on, this going on. And you're always fine. Yeah, I am. But you, I do have the odd down day sure. where I am down. And I just think I can't be bothered, you know, sod the world. I'm not going out today. I'm not doing anything. Done. And what I say is, you can have those days, but at the end of that day, draw a line on, in the sand under it. Go to bed thinking, tomorrow's going to be a good day. It's been a bad day. It's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. Go to sleep. Wake up and crack on. If it continues to go into the next day and the next day, then seek help, because that's when you're going to start suffering with depression, like right. I did. Luckily, snap yourself out of it. And I didn't realise I had depression, really, until I had that psychotic breakdown. And then I yeah. looked back and what the hell was I, you know, so yeah, so um, 
yeah, it's just been a roller coaster of up and downs. Yeah, what you were saying, I was just going to say what you were saying about um, telling people that are going through it now that have maybe just been diagnosed. Of all yeah. the people that can tell them that they need to be positive, yeah. you're the you're the person to do it because I, I haven't suffered like you have. So me yeah. saying that to them, they just be like, "Oh, it's all right for you, love." But the fact that you've actually been there, yeah, yeah. done that, lived through all those horrific experiences that you are the person that can can honestly 100% say that positivity has helped you through it all definitely oh uh, uh, yeah without without a shadow of doubt if it wasn't as positive as it was i probably wouldn't be sat, sat here now and that, that's just simple that's, that's how it is and uh, yeah i'm loving life now so um yeah i've got i've got work at the underground training station and um off the back of that there's a thing called the foundation now which was inspired by me from there what they do now and it, it, it's massive now um so pre post cancer peak patients go in free sessions free bespoke classes for them uh, but it's also going in and i work i now go out into schools and do a thing called active minds project so i'm in schools i'm teaching how to keep them healthy and active it, it's really good because exercise inhibits cancer by up to 40 percent okay. a lot of people that's so why I think you should be prescribing sport. And this is what we're trying to do now. Uh, the directors there are now working with Nick Miller, and we're working with Nick Miller, with GPs, trying to get um, referrals from GPs to our, to our gym. To wow. them, be, we've got a proper physio there. We've got a, um, an assessment nurse. It's all set up. They, they assess them and then direct them to which class they should be best suited. Um, but I also now go and work with the... Um, um, people with learning difficulties, also mm. physical um, incapacities, um, saying that there is a way you can, you can do sport, regardless, look at me. And I also mm. speak about um, adversity, facing it full on. And, and it kind of, and it is working well. And I've also done a, um, a bit with crime with the police. And there was a place in New Brighton where there was eight kids and we picked them, they, they're all antisocial behavior, the they were just going down, heading towards that life of crime. So we got them into our gym and I coached them. Didn't tell them as a police officer because that would defeat the whole object. They wouldn't listen to me. Oh, but sure. telling them of a world kickboxing champion did have a, <laughs> get, get a bit of respect then. <laughs> so um, got them in at peak time, seven to eight. And at first when they were starting, they were F this, F. Yeah. By the end, most of them were really good. And there was one girl called Cassie. And when I was younger, I remember my mum saying, one of your teachers said to me, um, if we could bottle what he had, we'd be a millionaire, but you have to be careful. He's going to go one or two ways with, with, with what he's got, and it's up to you to kind of guide him. I think that was massively hyperactive, massively. Probably had ADHD back then, but it wasn't described. So they channeled him through sport. Luckily, went on to win world titles and all, all this thing. Brilliant. I saw this in her. She was good at everything. So I just right. said to her, you need to get your dad to take you to a kickboxing gym or something, or a boxing gym, or get into some sort of sport. Went away, feedback was in that area that is, none of them had hardly been seen again. Got a message um, not long after, and basically she joined a kickboxing club and was representing that, their, their team, and she wasn't a problem. So I always said if we could help just one kid through this, yeah. and that was the one. Uh, and then I went to another place, something I'm particularly proud, gave off my story about not quitting, you know, time's gonna get hard, you know, credit doesn't go to those people online who are kinda, you know, you know, putting you down for trying. Credit goes to the person who stands up and keeps moving forward. They keep taking those body blows. They get up and dust themselves down and they keep going. Um, and after that, well, I was walking out and, and one lad, he just came up to me walking alongside and I was taking him to the gym to do a, a gym session with him all. He said, thanks for that. He said, I, I tried to kill myself last year. I said, oh, no, why? And he's X, Y, and Z. I won't go into it and stuff. I said, oh, no, he goes, I've been thinking of it again before. He said, listen to you speak and telling me that there is another way. He's like, I don't think I'll ever think about that again. And it was just that moment there for if everything I've been through stops him doing that, then it was worth it. I'll do it again in a heartbeat. So, um, so I get, it's good now to get to impact and try and help you a massive feel about youth development. So I get to kind of impart my knowledge of the horrific experiences on them and say, look, you're gonna go through hard times. It, hopefully it's not as bad as mine, but you, everyone's gonna go, when they get to adult life, growing up, 
you are going to uh, go through adversity and it's how you choose to deal with that is how, how you're going to the side of it so yeah okay wow so let's just recap on all the different things you're doing jumps around all sorts <laughs> no no it's brilliant it's brilliant because this brain, is all... i'll just brain i blame the brain tumor <laughs> <laughs> you're totally allowed to do that um, and i talk but, very know, fast i am fully aware <laughs> that's all right so there's so many things that you're doing i want to share all the links because there's going to be bits throughout there where that has made people's ears prick up and say oh i want to get involved in that i want to get involved with that so if you send me the, the links that would be yeah, awesome really cool really yeah because cool. yeah, um, yeah, i've got a video out on youtube which it's only two and a half minute one and it's just it's, it's on the twitter actually um at the top page and it's we made it with a guy called matt lambert who's worked with red bull line messi all the footballers and we put it together for the foundation and it's really it's only two two minutes 30. it's quite powerful and it's just a very brief like very brief overview of my quick story about the bike accident and the, and the cancer and it shows at the end of that it has the website for the foundation so if anyone with and it's not as i say it's not just cancer it started off as that it's it's learning difficulties, it's, yeah, it's depression, anxiety, all that. That's mental health as well. So the tackling the whole, whole spectrum of it, it's a super, as I said, I've been in gyms, trained all my life. I've never been to one like this. Never. Wow. We've got that, yeah. I've got a website, which I'll send you over for, specifically for cancer, which I post my story on, uh, treatment history. I've got a list of supplements. All different stuff as well that's on, on there. So, and there's a guide on there, the Defeating Cancer Naturally Guide. I put on that. Usually, I send out to people, but I just find it easiest to direct them to that website now. Fantastic. So what I'll do is I'll message you that. I'll message you, and also make sure we're watching the heist tonight at nine o'clock. Yeah, heist tonight at nine o'clock, definitely. <laughs> You've put the pressure on me now because I need to get this out the door and on onto YouTube. Oh no. <laughs> Friday, you, you don't know, do <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, good point, good point. Um, and I know you're still raising money, aren't you, for the hospice, um, UK hospice? Yeah, 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 I yeah, have been, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we yeah, the... yeah, my sister's currently doing the London Marathon for it. So um, so she's doing that at the moment, training towards that. So I'll, I'll, I'll send you a, a, a link for that as well. And it's just using a picture. It's, it's, it's in my mum's memory, obviously, because yeah. she passed her there. And the hospice was a... Will St. John's Hospice was a huge part. The way they looked after, not just my mum, but us, was unreal. And like all the money we, would, we had raised, because at the Christie's with my mum, they had said, um, the guy there is one of the best in his field. And he said, no, there is something we can do, because we were told there wasn't. But when she went to be part of, she had a private clinic, when she went to get a test done to be part of his, you know, normal NHS clinic, she never yeah. got out. Um, what she thought was fluid around her stomach it was just tumours. It spread. It was horrific. Um, and then so we managed to get a transfer to, we spent a while in, in um, the Christie's, brilliant hospital. But she didn't have her own ward. Everyone around is dying. Everyone's got cancer. Everyone. So we, I managed, we managed to get a move to, um, to Widow St. John's and they were building their own room, TV, you could bring flowers in. And it was such a nice, nice, setting for it and to put just a, a positive spin on that i always say if my mum would have walked out and got hit by a bus that would have been worse i had two years really but the, certainly me and my sister the last six weeks we were permanently with her and we got to say everything we needed to say we got to say our goodbyes we got to so that's the positive i take i had that time and i was with her when she passed and it was it was peaceful and that's kind of the positive I take out of that situation, which was horrific. Yeah. yeah so, so we're now raising money. She, my sister, certainly at the moment is doing the London Marathon. It's going to go to the UK hospice, but they are getting money. And the money we raised for her private treatment is now going to Will St. John's as well. So, awesome. So good, yeah. uh, Dave, it's been so good talking to you and hearing yeah. your story. Yeah. Uh, um, an absolutely incredible story from the motorbike accident all the way through to where you are now with it. You know, crikey me, what a, what a story. So thank you so much. No, no, no. You're right. It's just parts of me were just like at times and people who were going through this, fatigue kicks in. I remember 
getting up, going, walking upstairs, getting a shower, and I'd have to sleep. And at one point, I was training once a week, and it was boom and bust. I'd have a day where I'm fine, go to the gym, yeah, yeah. Next week, I'd be wiped out, and I started grieving the person who I used to be. Sure. So, and even up to recently, I think I still was, because I was this person in charge of this unit, high pressure job, driving in charge, yeah, rugby, yeah. So suddenly, having my wife check on me every five minutes, because she'd see me having a seizure, I've never seen it. I couldn't drive, I've only just got my driving back, license back this year, so four years. Mm. It's, it's green flat, but, and then not being able to train how I would, but all I used to think was I just need to fast forward a year, and now I train every day if I can. So if you're in this situation now, and you're struggling with fatigue, it will get better, trust me. You just need to plough through it. Keep positive, keep ploughing forward, roll with the punches, you will get out the end of it eventually. Awesome. Oh, Dave, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks for having me. Oh, my absolute pleasure. You, you are, I know you say it doesn't sit well with you, but you are a, a real inspiration. So thank yeah. you for putting all that positivity out into the world because it, yeah. it, it is helping people. Well, you've got, to, you've got to surround yourself, I think I always say, with positive people. And I cut a load of people away who were dead net moan because you can't have a positive life surrounded by people who are negative, and I call them like energy sucking vampires. If you ever have a conversation where he just moans non-stop, you come away going, drained. So yeah, you've got to stay positive. You've got to have positive people around you and do positive things. So awesome. yeah. Well, you're, if we, yeah, so you, rather than being a, uh, an energy vampire, you're like um, an energy fountain then. <laughs> there, you, there you go, I don't know if that's what I'm going to start using. <laughs> okay, yeah, energy fountain, brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Oh, no. If you if you like this video, please do hit the like and subscribe button and you'll get notifications when new videos are uploaded. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook if you search at Be Glad Movement. And please do get in touch if you've got a story that you'd like to share. It doesn't matter if it's something similar to that which someone else has shared because I really do believe your story and your voice has the time, has, has the time, has the power to um, help someone in, in their time of need. So please do get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. And I'll look forward to seeing you in another episode. Many thanks.